on One Plus One, former Prime Minister John Howard on the reaction to his memoirs and the genetics, physiology and neurology behind our political choices. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to the programme. Prime Minister John Howard won four elections and served for 11 years. But instead of a focus on his legacy, the release of his memoirs, Lazarus Rising, has reignited discussion about whether he did or didn't promise to hand over the reins of power to his deputy, Peter Costello. Here on One Plus One, he discusses his life, politics and beyond. John Howard, thanks so much for speaking with One Plus One. Some people would say there's little value in an autobiography that's written so soon after you've left power. What do you think about that? Oh, if you don't write it fairly soon, you uh, start to lose perspective, I think, and you, you get a lot of things wrong. And if you don't do it fairly soon, you will never do it. Uh, you really won't, because uh, uh, the longer you put it off, the harder it becomes. Uh, you get older, you have other distractions, and uh, I, I don't think you should try and write it um, within six months of uh, leaving government, but I do think um, unless you do it fairly soon, uh, some of the recollections will fade, uh, the enthusiasm will wane, uh, and you'll uh, end up uh, reconstructing events from a very flawed memory. <coughs> Now, there's already been a lot of discussion since your book was launched a few days ago about the fracas over the deal or no deal mm. between you and Peter Costello. Mm. Mm. Do you regret that so much attention has been paid to that issue? Uh, Jane, that was unavoidable. Uh, I couldn't write the autobiography without dealing with the leadership issue. Obviously, Peter had a different take on it than I did. Uh, I understand that. If I'd written it uh, and ignored that issue or dealt with that issue in a very anodyne fashion, then people would have said, well, this is not a serious uh, work. I mean, th th you always have some tensions in political parties over leadership. That's natural. I can't think of a, you know, a political party that hasn't had that. And what I tried to do was to set down my side of those events. And uh, Peter has a different take. I respect that. Uh, and I think we just agree to disagree. Uh, the real long-term take out of our relationship was it was a very positive one because we did work together very closely. I, I detail in a chapter in the book called The Wonder Down Under which talks about our economic performance and how central to that was that Peter and I worked together very closely, very cooperatively and our views on economic policy were very similar. In a sense though that period you've, you've spoken a lot about the economic success mm. of your period in power but in a way, you would have been making some big mistakes if the, the economy hadn't gone well at that time, wouldn't you? Because it was globally a very prosperous time. Well, it wasn't uh, so prosperous in other parts of the world. In some it was. Um, one of the misinterpretations uh, of that period is that all of the strengths of the Australian economy and all of our success are derived from the China boom. Well, the China boom didn't really begin in earnest for Australia until sort of 2002, 2003, and most of the heavy lifting, most of the big reforms, or many of the big reforms, had already been implemented by us uh, uh, before the, the full uh, thrust of the China boom arrived. Uh, I think we had some good times, I accept that, but we used them sensibly, and difficult things like having a tough budget at the beginning and taxation reform and weathering the Asian e economic downturn, all of those things occurred very early in the piece and the way in which we handled those laid the foundation for later success and later prosperity. But economic success and prosperity is always a combination of things. I mean, sure, there are some factors over which you have no control that will deliver you success or, or deliver you pain, but the way in which you react uh, determines whether you take advantage of it or whether you squander the opportunity. Let's talk a little bit about the leadership issue. Yeah. You've been accused of being selfish in mm -hmm. trying to hang on to power um, in 2007. How do you respond to that? Well, I don't think it's selfish if you um, take a decision to remain the leader when, as was clear in 2006, the overwhelming majority of your colleagues want you to. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think that's selfish. Uh, 
But I can equally though understand that, that, that uh, Peter wanted to be leader. I understand that. I mean, I'm, I wanted to be leader um, uh, and I can understand his aspiration. And I think all one can do in a situation like this is to tell the story from your point of view, put it in the context of the record of the government. I mean, the leadership chapter is one out of 46. Uh, and uh, uh, for most of the time that we were in power, leadership was never an issue. And when it did arise, uh, Peter and I always handled it in a fashion that it didn't interfere with the functioning of the government. Why do you think leadership is so much an issue now in Australia? It always has been. It was, it was an issue when uh, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating were, were, were leaders. It was an issue, I mean, you go back 70 years, the uh, uh, outbreak of World War II and the, you know, and the, and the pressures that led to uh, uh, Menzies losing the Prime Ministership way back then. Uh, there were arguments about leadership. It always will be in a democratic society. But what is crucial for a leader to be a good leader? Well, because he or she sets the tone of the government. Not follows what voters want? Uh, in, in, on some occasions you follow what voters want, on other occasions you believe that the national interest is better served by taking another course and you take that course but you set out to persuade the public uh, why taking that course is desirable. If I'd followed opinion polls we'd have never had a GST but I set out to explain the value of having tax reform. And yet throughout your book, you're constantly talking about the opinion polls, yes. reminding you what people are thinking, what mm. people want. Are they a burden for politicians? They're part of the landscape. Uh, a politician who never listens to the public won't remain in office very long, but one who only listens to opinion polls will never do anything good. Uh, you have to get a balance. And uh, that's what I tried to do. And there are plenty of cases in my Prime Ministership where uh, I, I argued against the tide of public opinion uh, and uh, there were other occasions where I responded to public sentiment because I thought that public sentiment had it, had it right and was in the long term interest of the country. Do you think our rather short electoral cycle, does that help a Prime Minister? I think longer parliaments would be better, yes, but I'm not sure that the Australian public would vote in favour of a four-year parliament. Uh, the people of New South Wales wouldn't vote in favour of a four-year parliament at the present time, which they have at a state level. And you can't lengthen the federal parliament's term without having a referendum because it's fixed in the constitution. So, and I'm not sure the public would vote to extend it. So the answer is, I think it would be better if you had a bit more time, uh, but I don't think it's going to change any time soon. When you lost government and you lost your seat, how did you pick yourself up? Well, I had, I had uh, the knowledge that I'd been there for a long time and I was reassured by the fact that uh, my government had left the country in very good shape. And the economic condition we left behind is the main reason why we avoided the bullet in the global financial downturn. So although I was disappointed at losing, uh, it's not as if I hadn't achieved a lot. And I knew that uh, my time in office was going to end uh, sometime uh, uh, either at the election or in a couple of years after that when I had indicated publicly that I would retire. But were you able to say that immediately or did it take a few days? Oh, look, of course, of, of course. Look, if you say that I feel overjoyed, no, I mean, I hated, I didn't like losing and, and, and I felt for a lot of my colleagues who'd lost and I... Uh, felt that uh, the government of the country, the quality of the government was going to, be, going to be different but it was a verdict of the Australian people and I accepted it in good grace in a democratic system but of course uh, I wish the result had been otherwise but it didn't completely shatter and demoralise me because I was able to look back with some pride at the things that we had done and that we had left the country in a stronger, prouder, more prosperous state than it had been in 1996. Have you ever felt shattered or demoralised over anything that you've done? Oh, of course. I mean, of course I, I, I felt, uh, when I was thrown out of the leadership of the party in 1989, I felt demoralised. Of course I did, uh, because uh, I thought I'd been through everything you could been through, could go through in 1987 with the Joe for PM campaign and a whole lot of other things. And then uh, you know, we, we get through that election and we, uh, we battle on and then I get thrown out. But that happens in political parties. Uh, 
as I say in the book, uh, leadership of politi political party is driven by the laws of arithmetic. Political parties vote for the person they think is most likely to lead them to victory. And no matter who the person is, if they think the current leader uh, is a lesser chance than somebody else, they'll get rid of that leader. I mean, they d the Labor Party did that to Bob Hawke. Bob Hawke's the most successful leader the Labor Party's ever had, by far. But they got rid of him in... Uh, 1991 because uh, they thought they'd have a better chance of winning with Paul Keating. There's no such thing as loyalty in politics, is there? Well, no, there, there is loyalty, but, but, but what I say in the book is that, is that what governs um, uh, the determinant, termination of a leader uh, is electoral uh, prospects. That's what governs it. Um, and, and people have no right to say, well, you can't get rid of me because it's disloyal to do so. I mean, they can say it, but... Uh, political parties are entitled to ignore. I mean, the, it wasn't disloyal of the Labor Party to remove Kevin Rudd. In my view, I thought it was politically a mistake, but Julia Gillard wasn't being disloyal in responding to the draft of her party. Voters might feel differently. Uh, yes, vo vo voters, voters felt rather differently in relation to that, and that goes to the question of whether it was a wise thing to do, not, not personal loyalty. Uh, a lot of voters resented that because they felt, well, if you're going to get rid of a first-term Prime Minister, we should do it, uh, and not uh, the factional heavies of the Labor Party. And I, I can understand that. And I in, picked up that mood as I, I did a bit of campaigning before the last election. Whereas in my case and Bob Hawke's case, uh, we've both been in power for a long time and um, <coughs> it was a different consideration. But in the end, what governs whether you stay or are removed is the majority view of your colleagues about your electoral prospects. And in the end, I remained leader because the majority of people always felt they had a better prospect of winning with me. Earlier this week, a member of the audience in Q&A threw a shoe at you, and you said a few moments ago that you knew this guy wasn't threatening. When have you felt threatened when you were Prime Minister? I actually can't remember having felt uh, physically unsafe or threatened. Uh, you do develop